Are there good people in the world who do good works? Does God recognize these good works in earning salvation? What about people who are Christians? Will good works earn them a place in heaven, or as we believe in the first resurrection? Will the Jews be saved by keeping the Sabbath and holy days? Well, in Mark 10, verses 17 and 18, Jesus says, No one is good but God. The Bible tells us that we are saved by God's grace and not by our own works. Grace is involved in God's calling and, in, and grace is involved in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our sins, which allows us the opportunity for salvation. Remember, salvation is a process. Grace is God's undeserved, unmerited gift. We don't deserve it. It's His calling. And we have to respond. But it says many are called, but few are chosen. Few are chosen because few resp uh, respond to that calling. And the pardon for our sins is through God's grace. God is no respecter of persons. You know, we, we must not be self-righteous, but we have to have God's righteousness in us through the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ. It's God's righteousness which enables us to do good works. Now, this, this issue was in the church from the beginning. The idea of, are we saved by God's grace or are we saved by our works? And when I say saved, it's a process. I'm talking about a process of salvation. The first process is, is conversion. But if you go to Acts 15, Acts 15, please. This was a big problem in the church. And uh, the issue of circumcision. And uh, Acts 15, verse 1. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So they're going to the headquarters church in Jerusalem, and they're going to speak to the elders and James, who was the head of the church at that time. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed, so these were Pharisees who, who, who had believed in, in Jesus Christ, uh, rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So they were insisting on keeping that uh, ritual of circumcision in order to be saved. Verse 6, now the apostles and elders came together to consider the matter, and when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by, by, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. That was through the household of Cornelius. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. So Cornelius and his household received the Holy Spirit. Gentiles, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. So he was making, Paul was making no distinction between the Gentiles and the Jews, as, it, as the Christian Jews, as it has... Uh, the issue, uh, the issue of, sal of salvation. Then all the multitude kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And eventually, there was a, a, an agreement by the headquarters, by the church, that basically circumcision would not be imposed on the on the Gentiles and. Basically, that yeah, it settled the question of whether circumcision was a requirement uh, for our salvation among the Gentiles. Among the Gentiles. So here we see, right from the beginning, works versus grace. Now we have salvation 
of us by grace through faith, through faith in Jesus Christ, we have salvation by grace. God's unmerited pardon. We don't deserve it, but he's calling us if we respond, if we repent and we believe in Jesus Christ and we're baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. Um, and then that's the process of conversion. But conversion, then we have to develop godly character, which is a lifetime process, a lifetime process through, through the fruit of the Spirit, through the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. We turn to Romans 3. Uh, please, Romans 3 and verse 24. Romans 3. Being justified freely by His grace, by God's grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a perpetuation by His blood, or an atonement by His blood, through faith, we have to believe, we have to believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he's an atonement for our sins, to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God has had passed over the sins that were previously committed. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that we might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So God justifies the one who has faith. In Jesus Christ, we're justified. But I mean, it's just giving you some scriptures now to reinforce the, the fact that we are saved, saved by by grace through faith. Uh, Romans four and verse one: What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So if we were saved by circumcision, we can boast. We're circumcised. You're not. I'm going to be saved, you're not. But, for what does the scripture say, verse 3? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. So, if we're going to work for our salvation, we, 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 accept, uh, we would expect wages. We would expect, okay, we did this, and now we, we have salvation. That's not grace. Grace is unmerited pardon. Grace is, is God's gift to us. Okay, uh, verse 5. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blesses the man whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Verse 9. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only, or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Abraham wasn't circumcised at that point when, he, uh, when God made the promises to him. Uh, in faith. And he received the sign of the circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had, while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe. Though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might, might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also but who also walk in the steps of the faith, which our father Abraham had, while still uncircumcised. It's all about the circumcision of the heart. To sum up that, what I just read. It's all about the uncircumcision of the heart. God gives us the Holy Spirit. He circumcises our heart. And uh, through faith, through our faith. Uh, Romans 4, verse 13. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law. The promise wasn't made through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For those who are of the law are heirs. Faith is made void and the promise of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath. In other words, we're, we're not under the law. That doesn't mean we don't keep the law. We're not under the law because we're under grace. We're under the grace of Jesus Christ. We're not under the law. We're not under the death penalty of the law. Jesus, Jesus' uh, sacrifice has taken us away from the, from the death penalty of the law. So that's what they mean when they say 
that we're not under the law. But, but, but some would say, well, that means we don't have to keep the law. But that's not, that's not the case, as I'm going to show you. At verse 16, Therefore it is a faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And when we're converted, when we receive the Holy Spirit, uh, we, we become the children of Abraham too. Just as uh, the Israelites are the children of Abraham, we are the children of Abraham also, as the scripture tells us. Uh, chapter 5 and verse uh, 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're justified by faith. Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace. So the more faith, God gives us more faith and so that we can grow in godly character. And that, and that is through his grace. So as we believe, as we're developing godly character, God gives us more faith. Remember, faith is one of the fruits of the Spirit, fruit of the Spirit. It is a gift of God. And we all, we all have access to faith. And uh, rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So we have access to grace through faith. And chapter 6, in verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That's another issue. Uh, some say, well, and even back in the beginning of the church, well, we could just go on sinning because we have God's grace. And God will forgive us. So it's a license to sin. And, uh, and of course, Paul is saying, uh, certainly not in verse 2, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in sin? And uh, verse uh, 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Again, you're not under the penalty of the law. That's what that means. You're not under uh, damnation, condemnation. Um, and verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. And you go to John uh, 1 and verse 14, please. John 1 and verse 14. We're showing here that salvation is by grace through faith. And salvation is not by our works. John 1 and uh, verse 14. And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we know that the Word is Jesus Christ, and if you don't, uh, and if you go back to verse one, you uh, you'll see that, and and and, uh, and, uh, and Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth. God is full of grace and truth, and He wants to give us. He He, he gives us His grace freely, so that we can know his truth through Jesus Christ. And uh, verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth, and, and we cannot be saved by the law. We can only be saved by God's grace and by God's truth, and by God's truth. Now, Jesus is the only Savior. Jesus is the only Savior. John, <clears throat> John uh, chapter 14. You know, the, the Buddhists have Buddha. The Muslims have Allah. The Hindus have Brahman and many gods. But there's only one name that we can be saved, and that's Jesus Christ. It's the only way to salvation through Jesus Christ. Uh, John 14. In verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So the only way we can go have a relationship with God the Father is through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, Acts 4, verse 12. Acts 4, and verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must 
be saved. And in the previous verse, it talks about how Jesus is the chief cornerstone. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We can only go through Jesus Christ. Uh, back to John, please. John 8. John 8. I'm giving you verses now to show you that Jesus is the only way, is our only Savior, and the only way to salvation. Uh, John 8, verse 23. And he said to them, You are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you, that you will die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So we're going to die in our sins if we don't believe that Jesus Christ is our Savior. So the Buddhists, the Hindus, the Muslims, they're going to come up in the, in the uh, Great White Throne Judgment. They're going to have the opportunity to know Jesus Christ. But don't kid yourselves. There's no different paths to God. There's only one path. There's only one way to God. And that's through Jesus Christ. Um, John 11, verse 25. John 11, verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He is the resurrection and the life. It's only through Jesus Christ that we can be resurrected and have eternal life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. He who believes in me, though he shall die, yet he shall live. In verse 26, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He says. That's a good question. Do you believe this? We have to believe this through faith, through faith, if we want to have salvation. All right, so uh, we saw in Scripture that salvation is by grace, through faith. We saw some Scripture that Jesus is the only Savior. But what about works? What about works? Well, we said that we're not saved by works. But works does play a major part in our, in our salvation process. Because when we're converted through grace... We show our faith by our good works. When converted through grace, we show our faith by our good works. We have to. We have to. We can only do good works when we're converted. Because we have Jesus Christ living in us. We have the Holy Spirit through the Holy Spirit. And we have the fruit of the Spirit that we, that we have access to. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, su gentleness, kindness, meekness. Self-control. If you turn to uh, James 2, please. James 2. I'm going to show you now that works is important. We, we need to keep the commandments. And the commandments are even, uh, even uh, magnified in, in the New Testament. Uh, if we go to James 2. And verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but doesn't have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. That's a, that's a, that. What a statement. Faith without works is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God? So you know, people have, have, have faith. Yes, there is one God. But, but do they have the faith to, to follow God and to believe in God? Yes, I believe that there's a God. You, you, you do well. But even the demons believe and tremble. So faith by itself is not enough. You know, you can believe in God, but you have to, your, your faith has to be demonstrated by your works. The works that God wants you to do. The good works that we talked about in the beginning. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? Very important. Faith was working together with his works. And by works, his faith was made perfect. So both of them complement each other. You can't have one without the other. You can't have faith without works. 
If you turn to John 14 and verse 22, please. John 14 and verse 22. As we wrap up, John 14 and uh, verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So, if we love Christ, if we have the love of Christ in us, then we are going to keep his commandments. We are going to keep his commandments. If we turn to Matthew 5, Matthew 5, please. Matthew 5, in verse uh, 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. In other words, what he's saying here, here, here is that if you have hate in your heart for someone, then you've committed murder. So, the commandment is magnified. Magnified. It's magnified. It's even... And, and the only and, and but we can, we can keep these commandments through the Holy Spirit in us. God is in us. Jesus Christ lives in us. Um, and uh, twenty verse twenty seven, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Again, how the commandments are magnified. They're magnified. Um, in uh, Titus, and we're going to keep the commandments. Uh, Titus three verse seven. And when we fall short, we we go to God in prayer and we repent. And uh, and as we are growing, uh, we have we're able to develop the mind of Jesus Christ. It's a process and develop Godly character. And. Um, and spiritually, spiritually grow. Titus 3 and verse 7. That having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. So those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. So when we have the Holy Spirit, it doesn't mean automatically that we're going to go out and do good works. But we have to believe we have the Holy Spirit. We have to believe that uh, we have to know the commandments of God. We have to uh, call on the fruits of the Spirit, gentleness, kindness, goodness, love and we have to begin to grow and develop and through our good works we are we are lights to the world we're ambassadors with jesus christ and uh and god uses us as priests as priests we were training how to be priests and and rulers in, in his kingdom so remember that we're saved by god's grace we are not saved by works, but works are important. The, the, the idea, this issue of grace and works is very, it gets people very confused. And they think and, and that, that we're saved, uh, that, that uh, we're not to keep the commandments because that's works. Uh, but where works comes in is that after we're converted, if we're truly converted, if we if we during the process of salvation, we must do good works. We must do good works because God is good. God is love. Remember, I told you before in Mark ten seventeen and eighteen, no one is good but God. So if we want to be good, we have to have God's goodness in us. So have a nice Sabbath.